Good afternoon, everyone. I am Nicole Lerda, and I am one of the director of marketing, uh, not marketing, director of major gifts for Carlo University. And um, we are here today with Val Pacini, and um, she will be presenting for us today a couple housekeeping uh, items. She, there should be time at the end to ask questions and you can use the chat feature. I will be watching that and we will go through your questions and uh, your comments at the end. And secondly, as you know, this is being recorded for future use at Carlo University. First thing I wanna do is introduce to you today, Val. Val Pacini is a reading specialist and instructor in the education department at Carlo University. She is the director of the master's in education in reading specialist program and also serves as the coordinator of professional development at Carlos Campus Laboratory School. Val has been in education for over 20 years. She has served as a classroom teacher, literary specialist, Title I teacher, staff developer, and as a member of the administrative team. She is the teacher consultant for the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project and founding director of the project, Writers of Westmoreland. She is a strong advocate for teachers having access and knowledge to implement evidence-based curricula and assessments, including ongoing support for using these tools in the classroom. So with that said, Val, thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm so honored to be here with you today. Thank you for the invite. Um, yes, I am Val Pacini. I am a reading specialist and instructor at Carlo University here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And like Nicole said, I am director of the MED and reading specialist program here at Carlo University. So we're here today to talk about dyslexia. And we don't have too much time, so I'm just going to jump in if you don't mind. Um, although I hope we do have some discussion um, at the end. So here are our learning intentions for today. We're going to briefly define dyslexia, examine the simple view of reading, overview subtypes of reading difficulties, consider how the brain learns to read, um, and compare structured literacy to typical literacy practices. And then we're going to discuss implications for instruction. And like I mentioned, I hope to speak with you all um, once this is over as well. So what is dyslexia? And dyslexia is just this, a developmental disorder that adversely affects the ability to read and write. Um, it can affect people of all IQs and dyslexic students can be gifted um, and dyslexic. It occurs on a continuum from mild to moderate. So now International Dyslexia Association's definition um, is this, and I'm not going to read it to you. You can just take a couple seconds to read it. You can also find it on the International Dyslexia Association's website, but I'm going to kind of unpack it for you as we move through the simple view of reading um, and the um, four reading subtypes, if you will, three. Okay, so we have this simple view of reading. Um, Goff and Tumner, 1986, um, explained reading comprehension with these two elements. So they talked about how reading comprehension is the product of word recognition and language comprehension. In other words, you can't have one without the other. And when we think about the simple view of reading and our students with dyslexia, we can ask a lot of different questions. We can think about saying to the simple view of reading, does the student struggle with word recognition? Does the student struggle with language comprehension? Or does the student struggle with both? Oftentimes with our students with dyslexia, those particular students struggle in the word recognition portion of the simple view of reading. So when we think about word recognition, we think about phonology, we think about alphabetic principle and decoding and sight word recognition. And I'll unpack that a little bit more for you too. When we think about language comprehension, we can think about different strands that also make up language comprehension. So we could say, does the student struggle with vocabulary? Does the student struggle with background knowledge? 
with verbal reasoning, with um, literacy knowledge, with language structures. So there's many elements that go into word recognition and language comprehension that together make a proficient reader. And that's the end goal. So like I said, most students with dyslexia are going to struggle in word recognition and mainly in that phonological core. Um, but with that said, there can also be, there's never just one mold, there can also be comorbidities. So students can struggle in different areas. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So when we think about these four subtypes of reading difficulties, I'm actually going to open up my document camera, if you don't mind, just for a moment. Can everybody see okay? Okay, awesome. So when we think about these subtypes of reading difficulty, we have our students over here in this section, this bottom right quadrant. And in this bottom right quadrant, when we think about that simple view of reading, this is the student that struggles with word recognition, but is okay on listening or language comprehension. That means if you are reading a passage or a text or a document to a student, their hand's the first one up to answer, right? They have the answer. They have the language to support that in comprehension. Now, when we think about word recognition in this particular student, what happens is we usually identify this in K1, sometimes two. Um, and we say, wow, this student really is struggling in either phonology, in alphabetic principle and decoding, or in sight word recognition. This student, can be put into this category. Not always, but sometimes can be put into the dyslexic category. Now, if we move over here into this subtype, when we look at our data across the United States, um, across a school, across a classroom, what we find is this is our largest subtype. And this particular student struggles not only with word recognition, but also with language comprehension. So when we think about this as our largest subtype, this is alarming <laughs> because this particular student usually gets identified in third, fourth, or fifth grade, right? So these two together, this is our second largest subtype. Now, when we move up here, this particular quadrant, this student struggles with word recognition, but I mean, doesn't struggle with word recognition, but struggles with those upper strands of the reading rope that we mentioned, um, those language comprehension strands like vocabulary, like background knowledge. Um, and this is a less common um, situation that we find, although this does exist. Sometimes this student can be considered hyperlexic um, and the words just pop off the page for them. So it's actually opposite of our dyslexic where we have low word recognition. They can read, but they really struggle with the language comprehension side. Now, over here, this is our good reader category. And we think about our good readers. I want you to think about this. They don't struggle in word recognition and they don't struggle with language comprehension. So they can get the words off the page, but then they also understand the language. 95 of our percent of our students can learn to read with systematic, explicit, multimodal diagnostic and intensive instruction that I'll elaborate a little more on as we move through um, our time together today. But what I wanna draw your attention to is what do these two largest subtypes have in common? Yes, you can see it. Thank you, word recognition, right? So what's at the root of word recognition? It's phonology. And I want you to think about in um, 2000, our national reading panel convened and came out with um, five big ideas of reading. And it was phon phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocab, and comprehension. And what happened was our schools and school systems all flocked to the second one, 
phonics um, because we were in the middle of these reading wars between whole language and phonics. So everyone kind of flocked to phonics. They said more phonics, more phonics. And we neglected the very important element that we needed the most, which was phonological and phonemic awareness. And at the root of word recognition is phonological and phonemic awareness. Students with dyslexia struggle with phonology, with hearing the word parts, with hearing the sounds and individual phonemes in the words. They struggle with decoding and getting those words off the page. They struggle with mapping speech to print. So with that said, knowing that that, that makes up our largest population when we look across our country, we think about our NAEP scores, right? Our National Assessment of Educational Progress. And we think of two thirds of our fourth and eighth graders across our country are reading below proficiency. And when we think about how this happens, when these students in this category who we said may or may not be categorized as dyslexia are identified as struggling with word recognition in K1 and 2, they often transfer into this category, left unremediated. <laughs> and what happens is that's why this is our largest subtype. But there's good news because it's easier to teach students word recognition and remediate them in word recognition than it is to catch them up in language comprehension. So we, we, it's encouraging to know that, but we really need to intervene early and ensure that our students that do struggle with word recognition, phonology, <laughs> Um, alphabetic principle and decoding and sight word recognition get the instruction that they need to close the achievement gap. So all students can be in this good reader category. For decades upon decades, we've been shoveling sand against the tide um, using a good tool called phonics, but really neglecting the core of the problem, which is the core of what dyslexic students struggle with too, which is phonology, phonological synthesis, phonological analysis, rapid automatized naming, nonsense word fluency. And we can go into this a little bit as well, but let me come back to my slides. Okay. So this reading brain, um, we know a lot from science about how the brain learns to read. So the brain processes language in the left hemisphere. The reading brain has four processing systems, which I'll briefly touch upon. And students must be explicitly taught phoneme grapheme, so sound symbol correspondences, in order to map words and read them as if by sight. Um, teaching students to read a whole word or a unit with those flashcards. I don't know if any of you were taught that way or have seen children taught that way, but that does not work. Whole word approaches and cueing systems just teach students strategies that poor readers use. Um, there's two great resources out there, and um, I created a Padlet for you that I will share at the end of our time together today with all these resources in them for you to follow up with. But Reading in the Brain by Stanislaw DeJuan and Mark Seidenberg's Language at the Speed of Sight. But I want to talk to you a minute just about those processing systems and the two that in particular impact our students with dyslexia. So here's an image of the brain um, from reading in the brain, Stanislaw DeJuan. And I just want to orient you a little bit. Let me grab my annotation tool here to these regions of the brain. So what happens is I said to you that we process language in the left hemisphere of the brain. So if you think about your brain in the left hemisphere, we have this area um, in the front of the brain called we know it, the prefrontal lobe, but we also have the phonological processor there. And that phonological processor helps us access the pronunciation, the articulation of the phonemes in the words, right? 
Now in the very back of the brain, we have way back here, we have the occipital lobe. Um, and in the occipital lobe, we have the orthographic processor. And that orthographic processor is where our brain processes those shapes and squiggles and lines that we form into letters. And so what happens is there's this area in between, because if you look at your brain, if this is the phonological processor and this is the orthographic processor, we have sounds and we have symbols. Are they close together? No, they're not. So we have this fold in the brain called the angular gyrus. And this angular gyrus connects the phonemes to the graphemes. And that is called an angular gyrus or phonics bridge. So that's that phoneme graphing correspondences. And that's where students do map speech to print. And eventually, through explicit instruction in that region, what happens is students map those words as if by sight in a, in a subset of the occipital lobe called the visual word form area or the brain's letterbox. So I'm going to go into this a little bit more and we're going to look at images of the brain. So when we think about our reading brain and what we know, um, we see a non-dyslexic brain versus a dyslexic brain. And so when we see this non-dyslexic brain, what I just described to you in terms of, and here's Broca's area, where we process the phonology portion of it, the pronunciation, the articulation of those phonemes. And way back here, we're processing those letters, right? So in between here is the angular gyrus or phonics bridge. Now, what's important to note in this particular um, image is there's activation going on in the brain. These colored spots are activation. So this is a non-dyslexic brain. The student is bringing, what happens when we read a word is it comes into the visual portion of that. We see those shapes and squiggles in the occipital lobe in that orthographic processor. Then we instantly connect it back um, and we form a word, phoneme graphing correspondences. We attach it to meaning and boom, we have the word. And this happens in 250 milliseconds. So less than a quarter of a second, right? It's, it's all happening so very rapidly in our brain. Now, when you look at the dyslexic brain, this is what you see. Up here in Broca's area, in that prefrontal lobe, that phonological processor, there's blood flow. There's a lot of blood flow, a lot more blood flow than in the non-dyslexic brain. But what this is doing is just compensating for lack of blood flow in that angular gyrus area in that orthographic processor too. So students aren't connecting the phonemes to the graphemes and words aren't getting mapped in that subset of the occipital lobe called the visual word form area. So that's how students with dyslexia are struggling, right? In that phonological core deficit. They're, they don't have instant access to those phonemes in the words and they have difficulty mapping them um, to their graphemes. There's no activation or blood flow happening back here. But there's good news for this. <laughs> So using MRI measurements of the brain's neuro connections or white matter, researchers have shown that in struggling readers, the neural circuitry strengthened and their reading performance improved after just eight weeks of a specialized tutoring program. Um, I put the link to this particular research in the Padlet, so you can look at this later, but it's really, really incredible. It's out of the University of Washington. Um, students were um, taught at the Linda Mood, one of the Linda Mood Bell centers, so it's a great piece to go back to, and it's so encouraging, right? So what type of instruction strengthens these, this neural circuitry? And that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, it's called structured literacy. And this not only helps our students with dyslexia, but it helps all students. Um, instruction that is systematic, explicit, 
multimodal, diagnostic, and intensive. And we're really going to struggle on that, I mean, stay on that multimodal component as we run through the remainder of our time, because that's why, what's going to create that white matter in the brain. That's what's going to create that neural circuitry and neural pathways in the brain. So our students can learn to read. And what is multimodality? Multimodality is giving students ample opportunity to see, say, hear, write, touch, move, feel what we're asking them to do. Um, in other words, worksheets don't grow dendrites, right? We're not thinking about just having students complete worksheets, go through flashcards. We're asking them to actually do something with this to create neural pathways in their brain. There's a great resource because of our limited time today. I wanted to give you as much as I could to follow up with. Um, structured literacy, what I'm talking about now, compared to typical literacy um, practices. And this is from Reading Rockets, Louise Spear Swirling. Um, it's a great article to read. Um, I have given the article in the Padlet, so you will see it there. But it basically compares what I'm talking about in terms of structured literacy, systematic, explicit, multimodal, diagnostic, and intensive instruction to what typically students are being um, taught with in schools. Um, and it's very eye opening. So I would encourage you to go back to it and follow up with this later if, if it's something that you're not familiar with. So when I think about explicit instruction, I think about leaving nothing out, right? We don't want to leave anything to chance. We want to be very explicit in our, our methods that we're bringing to our students as we're introducing new skills. So one place to find examples, and this is just one example of explicit routines and instruction is the Florida Center for Reading Research. And I just wanna point out a few things on this particular plan. This is a phonemic awareness instructional routine on segmenting. So pulling those sounds or those phonemes apart. Um, and what I really want you to see is the structure of the plan. There's an I do, there's a we do, and there's a you do. So that I do is where the teacher models the task. There's some teaching going on. There's some watch me as I do it opportunities. Then there's a we do where the student practices right alongside other students and the teacher. So they get that scaffold and support. And then there's a you do where there's always extended practice and we want to get students to the part, point where they are fluent and they have mastery and they build. We don't wanna build them on a shaky foundation. We want to have strong mastery in those word recognition skills. Like when we think about the simple view of reading, word recognition times language comprehension equals reading comprehension, we want them to be really strong in word recognition. And what's at the base of word recognition, remember? Phonology and phonemic awareness. We want them to be really strong there with the phoneme graphing correspondences so that they can free up cognitive desk space to attend to meaning. This is also in the Padlet for you. So let's just get into some multi-sensory instruction. I'm mindful of our time here. So we'll talk about those first two of the big five that I talked about, phonemic awareness and phonics. When we think about multi-sensory materials, remember we were saying we're giving students ample opportunity to see, say, hear, write, move, touch, whatever we're asking them to do. So manipulatives do come into play, but you can do things very simply with your, your fingers as well. And, we can do that with tapping, which I'll show you in a moment. So when we think about dyslexia and we think about um, struggling in the phonological core, when we think about phonological awareness, we have early, basic, and advanced phonological awareness. When we think about early, we're thinking about syllables, alliteration, onset rhyme, right? So if I say the word cat to you, the onset would be k and the rhyme would be at. So students would hear those bigger parts. Basic would be phoneme blending, putting words together and then pulling words apart. Tell me all the sounds you hear in cat, k, at. This is all just sounds. And then we have advanced, which is phoneme deletion, substitution, or reversal. So if I say to you, say the word stick, now say the word stick, but don't say t. What do you have? You got it. 
There we go again. Here's some ways and some manipulatives that we can do. We want to give students the opportunity to see, say, hear, write, move what we're asking them to do to build that white matter and those neural circuitry. So I was talking to you a little bit about um, tapping just a few minutes ago, and um, I wanted to show you just a way with a word that we can tap and finger stretch and actually phoneme graphing map this with our students. Um, and it's an explicit way to do so, right? So if, if I say a word to you, like the word stick, we just use that. You could just be tapping, right? Tell me all the sounds you hear in stick. Stick, right? So we would count the sounds. We would push chips to represent the sounds or markers, which I'll show you, and then we would write. Phoneme sounds, graphemes <clears throat> are the letters that represent those sounds. So I'll go back to my doc cam for a moment, and I'll just show you. We were talking about the word stick, right? So if we tap stick, stick, stick. And then we would say, what letter represents the s sound? What letter represents the t sound? Good job. What letter represents the i sound? Good. And what letters represent the k sound? One sound, right? So then we would have students blend. The word is stick. Good job. So that's phoneme graphing mapping, the tapping, the pushing, the representation of the grapheme for the phoneme. Um, and here's a great resource I can show you. I had it on there as well. And I believe it's in your Padlet um, that you might want to follow back up with. <laughs> Phonics and spelling through phoneme grapheme mapping. Um, Catherine Grace. It's great if you, a great resource um, for teaching phonics and spelling. It's best to get it through the publisher too, which is Sopris West. It's a little bit less expensive than you will find it on Amazon if it's something that you would like to look into. Okay, here are some additional resources also in the Padlet that influence um, the work in the science of reading and the body of the science of reading. Also, you can find this in the Padlet. Um, I do want to draw your attention as before we go to um, our question time. I do want you to know that we do have an MED open house this evening at Carlo, and I don't want you to miss out um, because there's lots of information about a lot of our programs, our master's programs, and one of them being in the science of reading. Um, so you could find information on the MED and reading specialist program here as well. But I put information on that in the Padlet as well. If you would like to join this evening at 6 p.m., um, I put information on how you can register and join tonight. Okay, so definitely don't let this be your final stop. You can learn more about the science of reading and dyslexia at Carlo University. Um, we have a four course dyslexia certificate. In those four courses, we have critical components of phonological awareness, structured literacy, um, dyslexia and structured literacy, structures of language and linguistics, and we have an assessment course, data integration and instruction. So those four courses make up the dyslexia cert, which actually feeds into our reading specialist certificate as well. And you can also go for a full MED in reading specialist as well. So all of this is aligned to IDA and structured literacy. And we do, we are currently going through IDA accreditation as well. So um, it's really wonderful, wonderful learning that's going to help all students uh, learn to read. So that particular QR code there is the QR code that will give you access to the Padlet with all of this wonderful information in it. Um, it is also in the chat for you, so you can click on that link. I would encourage you to do so before you leave today's webinar so you don't lose that information. You can also always reach out to me with any additional questions that we may or may not get to today. I know I want to be mindful of your time as well. I know some of you are here at lunchtime. So I'm going to stop. I think I did it, Nicole. What do you, you think? did? <laughs> you did right on time. That was phenomenal. Thank you so much, Val. 
Um, it is 1230, so we are going to close, but as you can see there on the screen, Val has generously put her email address right there, and it will also be in the replay that you will be sent after this. This will be sent to you so you could watch it again, or it will be on our YouTube channel. Um, I may be sending you some, some questions, Val. That was, that was excellent. Um, just quickly, does every school district have a reading specialist? Is this if, if you're noticing your child is maybe struggling, um, I assume you would go to the classroom teacher first, but is this? So the thing is that we need to start with core instruction. So yes, the classroom teacher is always the first stop sure. um, if you're noticing something, right? Because we want to make sure that we're strengthening core instruction the instruction that all students get access to so that there's less students in need of intervention from a reading specialist. Most schools do house reading mm -hmm. specialists and employee yeah. reading specialists. So yes, um, there's a lot of Title I funding from the government, from the federal government that supports this particular instruction. But um, I would always encourage you to start with the classroom teacher first there's screenings that exist, right? So all they're called universal screenings and that's what all students get. And we, we assess to find out three things, right? We assess to find out what kids need help through our universal screener. It's an assessment that all students get. Then we assess to find out what kind of help they need. So once we identify that a student is need of, in need of help, 40th percentile and below, hanging on by their fingernails, then we do a follow-up assessment, schools, we, right, to identify, okay, what kind of help do they need? Are they struggling with word recognition? Are they struggling with language comprehension? Are they struggling with both? And then we do follow-up assessments as we implement instruction to find out, is the work working? And that's called progress monitoring. So, um, <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Well, next we will be back again. We are continuing our Carlo connection. So we'll, we, we will be back in two weeks. That is April 7th at noon Eastern Standard Time, the same time all the time. And what we're going to be talking about in two weeks is how Carlo has reimagined our experiential learning program. Uh, prior to the pandemic, our students were able to go abroad and experience amazing things, but we had to pivot when we weren't allowed to travel anymore. So we're going to talk about um, what Carlo did to continue those phenomenal experiences for our students. And I think you'll be very impressed with what they, they had done and they're going to continue to do. And lastly, I want to um, speak on behalf of the entire advancement team. We are proud to report that we have been working on the $210,000 challenge grant from the Richard King Mellon Foundation. Um, and to date, we are excited to report that we have received one hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars, two hundred and fifty four. And um, to release those funds, we are working very hard to secure the remaining portion, which is ten thousand seven hundred and forty six dollars. So with that said, if you feel if you're feeling generous or you feel like you want to participate, you can go to challenge.carlo.edu. Again, that's challenge.carlo.edu or you can call Janet Guidis, who is the assistant director to the Carlo Fund, and she's at 412-578-6120. We have $10,746 left to go, and I we are confident we're going to reach our goal. So for everybody who has helped and supported us through this year, we thank you so much. And um, we will certainly also let you know when we hit that goal. So Val, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, and again, we will see you in two weeks, everybody. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.